Welcome back to Sister Circle Live. Rashawn and I had such an amazing time with Michael Eric Dyson when he joined us on the show a couple weeks ago. And our conversation with him was so good, I decided to continue chatting with him offset where we dove a little deeper into his best selling book, What Truth Sounds Like. Take a look. These are moments of historical remembrance. 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, 50th anniversary, you know, a few years ago, 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, death, Bobby Kennedy's death. So I wanted to write a book that kind of grasped at all that, but looked at it I indirectly by major events that occurred. So in 1963, there were big events. Uh, the Birmingham Movement, where uh, black people led by Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and others yes. tried to really topple Jim Crow and segregation. And then, in, that was in May, and then in 19, uh, and then in August, there was the March on Washington, but tucked between that was a great meeting yes. between James Baldwin and Harry Belafonte and Lena Horne and Lorraine Hansberry and Bobby Kennedy, who was then the United States Attorney General. And I wanted to look at that uh, meeting. I had heard about it, read about it, read a few things, but I didn't read a real in-depth analysis. So I said, since I can't read one, I might as well write it myself. Huh. What came from that meeting that That's is a great so compelling? Point. That's a great point. Well, uh, Bobby Kennedy changed his mind about race. Uh, that's a big thing, right? Yes. Because when he went into the meeting, he thought the Negroes were going to be grateful to me for all the things we've I've done. done. Yeah. And, you know, but it was a Stevie Wonder moment. You really ain't done nothing, mm -hmm. you know, with the Jackson, without the Jackson 5 duty wop in the background. <laughs> so <laughs> the reality is that, like many white liberals, you know, they thought they were doing as best they could, but what was the deal? John F. Kennedy was the president. He called the, uh, the governor of Georgia at one point to get Martin Luther King Jr. out of jail. Negroes heard about it, as we were then called. And then they said, with well, those who could vote, we're going to vote for John Kennedy. He got Martin Luther King Jr. out of jail a few days before the 1960 election. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he told the governor, I'm not going to use federal authority to enforce desegregation and integration. I'm going to let you do what you do with the Jim Crow. So they're talking out both sides of their mouth. Okay. Talking about civil rights on the one hand, denying it on the other. So Bobby Kennedy uh, was that guy who represented the administration's approach. And then at the same time, he was thinking, why is it there's so much violence out here and black people's appeal, I mean, p black people's attraction to rage? He saw that happening in 1963. They're listening to the black Muslims, not Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, they're listening to people who are talking about, quote, extremism, and he wanted to figure that out. So he said, I'm not going to talk to the regular leaders. Let me talk to people with their fingers on the pulse of black mm -hmm, America. Mm -hmm. You know, as the great philosopher Sean Carter would say, streets is talking. Yeah. So what are the streets saying? And he figured I could talk to James Baldwin and others to figure that out. But when he got to the meeting, he thought it was going to be good. We're going to tell you what's going on. And, and does this sound familiar? There are white people who are being alienated in the Democratic Party. We have to figure out a way to bring them back. Oh, at the, at the expense of us. Right. Forget our civil rights. Forget that we're faithful and loyal and still here. You're trying to recruit people back into your movement who left because they're mad that we're getting our rights. Mm. That's what happened in 2016 as well in terms of identity politics. So they went there, thought there was going to be a great meeting, and they lit Bobby Kennedy uh. up from the time that meeting started to the time it ended three hours later. He was seething. He was mm. mad. He was angry. He sick the FBI <laughs> on the people who were there. In other words, the white liberal icon got dossiers from J. Edgar Hoover of the ones who were already there. And if it hadn't been started, he started them. So this is the tragedy that the white guy on our side sick the FBI on us. And one of the media people who were there was Clarence Jones. He was the lawyer for both James Baldwin and Martin Luther King Jr. So eventually, Martin Luther King Jr. gets caught up in that. And the way the FBI begins to vi uh, wiretap him mm -hmm. is under the authority and signature of uh, the Attorney General of the United States of America, Bobby Kennedy. But after he cooled down, he said, you know what, if I was black, I'd be mad too. I'm going to change how I think about race. I'm going to tell my brother, don't just make it a political issue, make it a moral issue. Mm -hmm. Not just what's going on in public policy, but how people feel and talk and respond to each other. And then, for the rest of his life, for those five years, he became one of the fiercest advocates for not only people who were poor and vulnerable, but for black people as Do well. Do you feel like the way that you have researched this particular mm -hmm. meeting that has never been told in this way? Well, uh, from I mean. your mouth to God's ears. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and to the New York Times bestseller. Come on list. now. Uh, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Won't he do it? Won't so, he do it? Uh, so, yeah. I mean, that's why, look, I wanted to read a book about it. Couldn't find one. I got to write it myself. How about that? You know what I'm saying? Yes. I mean, I wanted, to, I wanted to read a book that says, why was this meeting a, a linchpin? Why was it critical? Why was it important? And, and what I do, I tease it out. I don't just leave it there. 
because I got a Dysonizer, so I got to update it for what's going on now. Yes. So I talk about, if, who was in that meeting? Uh, Bobby Kennedy was in that meeting, so I talk about white politicians. Donald Trump and I talk about Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump, a guy who stands up every morning to excrete the feces of his moral depravity into a nation, he's turned into a psychic commode. That's what he's doing to us, right? A bigot in chief, a racist in residence. That's what we got there. Hillary Clinton, a much more critical figure. Now, there were some black people trying to tell me, ain't no difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Are you on drugs? Right. Right? No matter what she is, well, she's not likable. She ain't trying to be a woman. She got a man. No. The reality is she's trying to deal with the truth of American society. Right. So I dealt with them. Who else was in that meeting? Intellectuals in that meeting. So I talk about the intellectuals who are here today, talking, writing, thinking, critically engaging. I, I highlight one, Aaron Aubrey Kaplan, who's not often talked about, but a beautiful writer. Ta-Nehisi Coates has talked about it. I yes, deal with him. Yes. But she's an equally beautiful writer who doesn't get the play. So I talk about her, and I talk about the beefs between intellectuals as well, because we like rappers. Mm -hmm. Push your tea, push your tea and drinks. Oh, we be beefing, <laughs> talking about it like we steeping on the tea. But anyway, oh, oh. don't make me spit lyrics. I'll talk to you like I got hysterics. <laughs> but, uh, so the point is, we talk about that. Then I talk about who else was there. Artists were there. So I talk about, you know, the tension between a Harry Belafonte, the greatest artist activist in the history of the 20th century, and a guy like Jay-Z. Yeah. And, you know, there was some beef so between trying, them. So you're but basically were... trying to correlate what happened then yes, to what needs to happen. You're far more succinct and efficient. I yes, mean... that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Right. That is, get me back on track. That right. is what I'm doing. That's what you you're know? doing. But I'm trying to spit a little bit, man. Get people interested in the book. Yes, and that's exactly what you're doing. Because we done had doing. a heavy segment up in this piece right here. <laughs> yes, we have. God damn, this the day I come on the show? <laughs> this what I get? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But this is what you get. You oh, get listen, listen, right you here. know what? Lord have mercy. Me hey. too. Don't make me call the police on myself. Oh, Don't make me call the police on oh, myself. My but here's the point. Absolutely right. Um, you know, to, to think about what's going on today, how it was going on then, how we understand the critical engagement of black intellectuals, mm -hmm. artists, entertainers. So I talk about uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce and what they're doing in terms of Black Lives Matter, in yes. terms of embracing black people. I mean, Jay-Z ain't just talking about, you know, his chains and, and how many cars he got. You know, people forget that he said back then, back when, the police was al-Qaeda to black men. Mm -hmm. So he's already on that political tip. Yes. Beyonce, white people discovered, oh, my God, she's a negress. Yes. She's black. Mm -hmm. she's, yeah, she's been black. She black from Houston. She black from her mama and daddy, Louisiana and Alabama, feeding into her. But her also being explicitly identified with the most vulnerable people who are her people and unapologetically, even yeah. her mama, a great woman, Tina Lawson. Are you sure, sure you, you want to talk about Baytella? Right. Right, right. And she said, that's what I got it for. That's what I got this fame for. Mm -hmm. If I can't be myself now then when can with I? all these millions and what I'm doing, when is it? Yes. When is it possible? Yes. So I talk about her. I talk about the athletes. Mm -hmm. We got a president trying to make people feel that they are un-American yes. because they want to stand up for us normal, ordinary, African-American people who don't have the bully pulpit, the platform that they have. But they are like an Ali. They are like a Lou Alcindor. They are like an Althea Gibson or Gibson or Wilma Rudolph. Or now, even uh, Serena uh, Williams, Williams mm -hmm. is out in that same yes. uh, tradition, or yes. Venus as well. So yes. that book has all that stuff in it at the same time. Hey, and this is what truth sounds like. That's Michael L. Dyson, like. thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate you. This is the time you needed, my brother. This is what I need. We'll be right back for more. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, he's so smart. He's an awesome person. Oh my God.